is Diane. You're admittedly somewhat hungover 40 something. And this is Biters. And this is Marnell, uh, your sometimes fill in permanent co host. Welcoming okay. also. This is Tom, your obsessed walker stalker. <laughs> <laughs> The Such super, a fitting title. The super fan who shows up in, in Kirk's artwork. I didn't realize that. I never knew that. Yeah. yeah. I, show up, I show up in a lot of the, the non-episodic posters. That was pretty cool when I saw that on Twitter the other day. I was like, I know that zombie. <laughs> yeah. Wait till you see the finished piece. Oh, right on. Very good. I, ah. saw the fin- I saw the finished piece tonight. It's not released yet. Because you know, it's for Nashville, I got to right? get Twitter. You do yeah, it's, to- for, it's for Nashville. I finally got a new phone, so I'm just getting used to it. But it's like, you know, it's it's clean. It's got more memory. It's not five years old. (laughs) So uh, I really need to install Twitter and get myself a clever handle. Yeah, you have to get Twitter. Twitter is where you find out all the the cool info. Yeah, I admit I use it to follow Walking Dead people and to occasionally troll the president. And I know, Thomas, that you and Brian are more on (laughs) You you share more territory I'm not, than we're not talking. We're not talking <laughs> politics. Exactly. We don't talk politics on biters for that very reason. But I had to admit that that was one of the things that I do with with Twitter. <laughs> Walking, look at this. Walking Dead brings us together. It does. Isn't we are, that amazing? We are Brian's token liberals. We are. <laughs> <laughs> no comment. <laughs> Well, so now we're kind of your token liberals, or you're our token conservative. So, <laughs> I'm I'm the token vote for whoever is best for the job. There you go. I, I don't consider myself one or the other. I look at who's better for the job, and that's what I go with. Well, maybe we all have better opportunities <laughs> next time around. <laughs> yeah, I was just gonna say we didn't have great choices this time around. So. I was going to say, I'm registered undeclared, because in Alaska, if you registered undeclared, you get to choose your ballot at the um, <sighs> the one before you really, really vote. God. Now, see, I'm not, because I wanted to caucus. And if you're going to caucus for a specific candidate I... in Alaska, you have to be a part of their declared party. So it only takes like 30 days to switch. So I, I switched to caucus, but I switched back. Thomas, how is it in in so, New York? episode two? <laughs> <laughs> I was just going to ask you if you were able to vote in the primary, whether you were registered with a party or not. I wasn't going to ask you how you voted. <laughs> I I actually uh, about six months before when I had to renew my driver's license, I switched parties just so I could vote in the Republican primary. So you do have to vote in. You do have to be registered for the party to vote in their primary. For the primary, yeah. yeah. Okay. See, okay. That's such a dumb rule. So anyway, now we'll stop. <laughs> so I have to tell you guys, I actually have this really. I know I mentioned this last time, and the memory is becoming stronger. I really do have this memory of doing a season one recap with Brian, but I haven't gone back and looked. And now that mm. we're committed, I kind of don't want to know. So. <laughs> oh, I don't I'm think. Totally I don't, I don't think. I really don't think you did because I've listened to Biters since Kirk and. Okay. Jeff. Since Kirk and Jeff were doing it, and I don't remember hearing a recap from you. I know that we did Vatos, and I know that we did the pilot, and I can't. Maybe we just picked some episodes that we really liked. Either that, or they just weren't memorable enough for me. Well, or they were. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> did you, did you do they were like off an, season, so. An o- did you do an overall season one recap, like all six episodes well, in one episode? No, no, no. It was several episodes, but really, honest to God, I can't remember like exactly what we did. <laughs> so I was, I was doing this too. I was thinking, God, I, I was going to talk about something. I was like, I think I've already talked about that on the on on Biters. But we have so many conversations about the show right. with other people or offline that I just right. I can't remember if that was recorded and aired or not. Well, you know, and here's right. the deal. If people will listen far enough to be able to comment on the Spooky Chef, they they can listen to this or, or not. It's their choice. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was funny. Yeah, I actually listened and I commented on the Spooky I- Chef. It was funny. It cracked me up. I thought we went fell down a lot lot of rabbit holes, and I thought it was very funny. So, (laughs) 
All right, but we have to keep on task tonight. Okay. Diane is I know, on the here, timeline. I'm the one who says we have to keep on task, and I'm the one who's wandering. So we're talking about Guts, season one, episode two. Um, I rated it 4.75 out of five red Dodge Challengers. Oh, love it. I rated it 4.5 meat ponchos. <laughs> My rating was, well, I had two. I wasn't sure if I was able to save the first one. You could go with both um, of them. All right. Well, it was 4.8 sugar tits out of five. <laughs> Pretty sure and you can direct quote. I wasn't, I wasn't sure if I was allowed to say that one. So then I went with 4.8 cheesy mermaid necklaces out of five. <laughs> that was a cheesy necklace. You know, I, I have some comments about the necklace just kind of in context. But yeah, it, they could have picked a better piece of jewelry. Yeah, that looks like something you got out of a gumball machine. <laughs> but I can say I know I know for a fact that Emma Bell, who played Amy, uh, she, she is really into all the, all the stuff that Andrea was saying. Oh, that's cool. She was she's into like the fantasy stuff and mermaids and dragons and all that. Okay, oh my! So in keeping, and with... she actually wrote a book. Emma Emma wrote a book. It's not out yet. I think it's oh. called Realm. Cool. Huh. Well, so, so in keeping with the, the bunny slippers conversation, did she get to keep her mermaid pendant? Oh, that I don't know. I didn't ask her. <laughs> <laughs> I would doubt. I would tend to doubt it. Who? Well, would would she want to? Uh, you know. Memorabilia. I think I would. In the context in which she received it, sure. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I would love to have it, even though it's cheesy, but I don't know. I, I doubt. They, the Walking Dead's pretty strict about Pretty tight what about there. Get. Yeah. Although you could steal that horse for me. <laughs> the horse. Yeah. <laughs> He's a cool horse. He's a very cool horse. I actually have uh, that day that I, the picture that I posted where I was sitting with him, uh-huh. I got his horseshoe. Oh, that's cool. Like it was a charity. It was a charity thing. And uh, I was bidding against Annie Miller's mom. <laughs> on the horseshoe that was worn by blaze the horse that rick rode and attached to the horseshoe is is like a big big clump of buttons hair because it's the same oh. re- the same trainer has both horses and buttons is the horse that uh daryl a- daryl and yes. aaron were trying yeah. to capture yes and got eaten. another horse that didn't fare well in the walking dead <laughs> exactly they all survived just fine until human intervention, didn't they? Exactly. <laughs> Do we ever find out what happens to the horse that Michonne was riding at the prison? Michonne rode a horse uh, at the prison? Yeah. I don't remember that. I don't that. remember that. You guys. I was wondering, because I, I rewatched season one and part of two ye- yesterday, and Maggie, I remember, rode the horse right? to get, to get right. Lori. She got Lori and went back. And I was thinking, I'm like, that horse, I bet, survived. You know, well, we never did road horses. They did. And we never did find out what happened to their horses when the farm was overrun. So we hope they survived. Until human intervention. <laughs> <laughs> we'll assume they did. So Blades is being used in the kingdom now, right? Or Blaze, rather. Uh- Oh, I I don't know if it's I don't know if it's the same horse. I actually think I'm, I read I'm assuming that... it. I'm assuming it's the same trainer. For those of you who don't know, Diane is like horse crazy, so <laughs> yeah. she's very. I I trust everything she says about horses, as far as like Michonne riding one and Blaze being used in Kingdom. And I do think I'm sure Diane is kept in the Kingdom. Track. <laughs> I mean, it's it, it's possible. I'm I'm sure they would go to the same trainer. It makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it depends on the horse's agent. Right. (laughs) Maybe I need to give his agent a call. (laughs) Okay. So um, the same day numbers for this episode were 4.71 million views. So it was, it was pretty respectable. It held up with the, uh, the premiere. And it originally aired on November 7th, 2010. And it was called Guts, which we all know. And those numbers just seem so low now. I know. It's funny, isn't it? But you Those know, are like Fear the Walking Dead numbers. Right. Now. I mean, I'm looking at numbers for Preacher and for American Gods, and the numbers are like a third of that if, we're, if it's a good day. So... 
Um, do you have the plus seven numbers? I don't. I didn't look at the okay. plus seven. Do you? No. Okay. Did they even keep track back then? Um, that's a good question. I don't know if they did live plus seven then or not. The uh, the extra num- extra numbers that I had for the pilot were ones that were um, like special viewings that were held encore viewings that were held after the the original pi- premiere of the pilot. So I didn't have plus seven numbers for that either. I'd be willing to bet they didn't have them back then. Quite honestly, I didn't even know what a live plus three or live plus seven was until I started working on biters. So. <laughs> Well, so the title, um, I'm going to usher us on to that. I just think that it it's literally about guts. We know that. Marnell mentioned the meat poncho. It also takes a lot of guts to do what Glenn and Rick did. So I gave a pretty literal read of the title when when I was looking at it. Do you guys have anything else? I mean, no. that was what, that's what I was going to say. I was just going to say, I think more along the lines of Glenn helping Rick to begin with. Mm-hmm. Because he didn't, he didn't know Rick. He didn't know what this guy is. He just sees a guy in a tank, and it reverts back to what Maggie said at the finale of this past season. That's where it all began. Right. He made he made that decision to help, and that that's what created this entire family that they have now. I was thinking about that again when I was rewatching, and I especially thought, and and I've always loved this line anyway, but the line where Glenn says, well, let's just say that if I was far this far up Shit Creek, I hope that someone would help me. Yep. And, and he uh, said, then that makes, that makes me more of a dumbass yes, than you. Yes, <laughs> yes. And I, I thought again how nicely that tied back um, from the season seven finale. That was really good. Yeah. Yeah. So, well, yeah. so Di, what was oh, go your ahead. good? No, what was so, your good? Oh, you are totally skipping ahead, Marnell, and we're totally talking oh, am over I? Thomas. <laughs> Spotlight. <laughs> so I just wanted to say a couple of things real quick about the director. So the director was <laughs> Michelle McLaren, and she actually met Vince Gilligan when she directed for The X-Files. She directed an episode that he had written, and then they made a connection there and they worked on Breaking Bad together, and then her Breaking Bad connection is what got her to The Walking Dead. So I always like to look at those those kinds of connections that get people where they are. It's a pretty good resume. Yeah. Not only that, but also on the resume, Game of Thrones, Westworld, uh, Hell on Wheels, which I really loved, and Better Call Saul. So she's she's got quite the career. Um, and then Frank Darabont wrote last week, and he wrote this week as well. So, okay, featured cast. So I chose Irony Singleton. Who plays T-Dog. Right. Know, and I know absolutely nothing he's been in before Walking Dead. So the only thing that I know well that he was in before The Walking Dead is he played one of the bad guys in The Blind Side. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's, that's right. right. I forgot about that. And I know that because my husband loves that movie and loves Sandra Bullock. So, <laughs> well, and he was also in Remember the Titans, which is another football game. Oh, football. Okay. Movie. Yeah. Lawrence Gilliard was in uh, The Blind Side, too, I think, wasn't he? Uh, I am going to have to look at the Google. I think you're right, actually. I thought he was. I maybe, or, well, I know he was in Waterboy. Maybe I'm confusing football oh. movies. <laughs> Because <laughs> the water boy and blindside are so similar. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I don't see him listed. All right, my bad. Good try, though. Good try. <laughs> Credit. <laughs> Did you yeah. know, by the way, that there's a pulmonologist in Florida named Lawrence Gilliard? <laughs> <laughs> I did not. I wonder if he's listening. See, now that's a free ad for that pulmonology service. So if you're in Florida, look him up. <laughs> we we don't know if he's any good. <laughs> right. I was Disclaimer. Just the same thing. <laughs> if, if he's horrible, we did not send you to yeah, him. If he's horrible, this isn't a referral. It's just casual chatter. <laughs> Um, so I picked Irony Singleton because I have listened to a few of the interviews that he's done that Walker Stalker has posted, and I really, really like him. He's a really engaging guest. He's got good stories. He has a really good heart. Um, and Nicest he, guy in the world. Really? You've, I've, you've, he, I was going to say, I'm assuming you've met him. Yeah, I've met him a couple of times. He is the nicest guy in the world. He, he uh, 
the first time I met him, I I had I have a life size sculpture of Merle's zombie head. Oh, cool! And I and it and it's made out of like latex, so it's kind of soft. So I I brought it to get a photo with him, and he grabbed it out of my hands, and he starts screaming. He's like, "You know what you did to me on the on that roof?" And he starts punching it in the <laughs> starts punching it in the head. But That's he's the cool. nicest, nicest guy in the world. You know, one of the things that really struck me about him is he's got such a sad story. He he grew up in a really hard neighborhood. He was abandoned by his dad, single mom. His mom died of HIV when he was just graduating from high school. Um, he actually chose the name Irony because it... it because of the irony of him overcoming all of the difficulties that he had when he was younger. His, his birth name is Robert. Um, and one of the things that I would love to see that I have still never run across is he actually has done a one man show and a book called blindsided by the walking dead. And it's kind yeah, of he, his story. He did them. He did them at uh, uh, a bunch of Walker stalkers. He did performances. I really would love to see that. And I know that yeah, I, 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 I wish never that got they to. would, I wish they'd release it. You know, I wish they'd do like a a DVD or streaming release. And I mean, I would pay for it because I would love to see it. So that's one of the reasons that I picked Irony Singleton this week. Everyone I know that saw it said it was fantastic. And, and, and a little is, bit that I've heard is cool, but I've never been able to hear the whole thing. Yeah, and he's he's great. I've seen a bunch of panels with him, and he'll he'll break out into rap and start yeah. singing. Um, yeah, he's he's great. And I just thought that the tension between him and Merle was such a good part of this episode. It was another great reason to uh, to go ahead and make him our featured cast this week. So now, Marnell, we well, can launch in. <laughs> unless, <laughs> unless you have something to add, Thomas. Well, he actually has, um, he's like the writer, producer, director for White Man, Black Man, Jew Man. Now, it where is, is a original comedy motion picture set on location in Atlanta, Georgia, metropolitan area in the tradition of Blazing Saddles. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my yeah. God. Blazing Saddles Friday, Dogma and South Park. White Man, Black Man, Jew Man is an energetic satirical comedy that both character and plot driven are riotously funny and unexpectedly moving, yet subtly profound and meaningful messages about the importance of communication in bridging the divide between race, religion, and politics. It will become a movie that captures the heart of anyone who sees it, a new standard for African-American film. So is it released? It came out in 2007. Oh, well, we'll have to find it. Yeah, you got to go under IMDb and look under (laughs) other credits. (laughs) <laughs> well, no, I was just thinking it would be nice to watch the movie. Maybe no, no, someday no. we could get it together and do that as a one-off. Yeah, right, that's but I what mean, I was it, it, Find it, the movie, not find the listing. It, it didn't look like it was uh, listed under his acting credits, but ah. it was listed under, like, producer, director, writer. I didn't check. I didn't, it didn't stand out to me under... Oh, it is. It is under his... Uh, so he did produce, direct, and write, and star in... White man, black man, Jew man. I'd be willing so, to give it a watch for a one-off. Yeah. That would be fun. I will have to see if I can find that somewhere. Very good. I still owe you a Pollyanna What's-Her-Face movie. <laughs> yeah, I finally got, I finally got uh, the other movie I'm going to watch for that. Uh... Because the other one was actually pretty good, but I, I want to see if it was a one-off for her or if uh, she's just really bad in... in the, the Walking, Walking Dead. Dead. <laughs> and, I, and I don't mean her. I'm sure Pollyanna is a, a wonderful woman, but her character is awful. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to get to see her on Saturday. Haven't well, met her yet. She's going to be in Portland, too. But I have to admit, I'm not going to stand on her line unless you tell me I absolutely have to. So I, I, don't, think, I don't think she'll have much of a line. <laughs> <laughs> see, that would make me stand in her line. Just to be a good like, person. Yeah, because I'm, I'm, sure, she, I'm sure she is a great person she is a great actress it's just a it's it, and it's not her fault it is a poorly written role that is i mean it's it's not even in the comic book so we have nothing to compare it to i don't know if it's supposed to be that bad um, no i mean i i wasn't even saying I, I didn't mean anything disrespectful it's just at the at the conventions the the b characters if you want to yeah. call them that they don't usually have much of a weight right so I you could you that. could pretty much you can pretty much walk like if you wanted to see Stephen Young, then 
you're going to wait a while. But even even people like Enid or the, the lesser characters, you don't mm-hmm. have to wait too much. So if you want to just say hi, you, you'll be able to in Portland. And, you know, maybe I need to watch the movie before I go so I could be like the one person in Portland who could discuss something other than walking <laughs> down with her. <laughs> She might appreciate that. Yeah, no kidding. You know, how many I, times are people going to come up to her and just go up, up, up? Right. <laughs> oh, uh, I'm going to go. I'm going to go over to her and just say, "Sign, sign, sign." <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> you know, I had a chance to talk to William B. Davis from the X Files, the Smoky Man. Yep. And I was really bummed out because the person that I had a chance to interview him with just wanted to talk about the X-Files and I had read his autobiography. So I wanted to talk about some of the other stuff that he'd done. And I, I just thought, you know, if I were William B. Davis, yeah, I know everybody knows me as the smoking man, but I'd like to talk about more than just that. (laughs) And I would imagine Pollyanna McIntosh probably feels the same way. (laughs) I'm sure it's like poor Leonard Nimoy before he died. I mean, he did write a book saying I am not Spock. And then later followed up by I am Spock. Right. Right. He'll always be Spock. Exactly. Yes. Just like, like Andy Lincoln is always going to be Rick Grimes. Yep. And Chan, Chan, poor Chandler Riggs is yes. always going to be Carl. <laughs> Carl! <laughs> His career is just, just starting and he'll always be Carl. Yeah. Okay, did you notice in episode one when Rick was going through the house yelling Lori and Carl, he was saying Carl normally. He was saying Carl he was enunciating. No. I don't know <laughs> when Coral evolved. <laughs> but of course, it gained a lot of traction, I think, in the prison. Because uh, that's when Rick started going crazy and yelling a lot. What, what, is, what does uh, t- uh, Brian always say? He says uh, making the phone calls or hanging up the phone or something like that. He always makes a reference to, to the phone calls. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, yeah. That's funny. All right. So, Diane, are we going to go into good? We're going to do good, bad, and ugly. So I guess I'll go ahead and start. I I loved the writing for this episode. So that was my good. And just some of the examples that I chose were just some really funny, witty lines, like when, when... Rick says to Glenn, you know, I have to admit I'm getting a little concerned in here. And Glenn says, oh, you should see it from out here. <laughs> yeah. Or the just the whole exchange between Rick and Merle on the rooftop. The white I'm meat, officer dark meat. Fr- yeah, the, yeah. You know, we're all just white meat and dark meat. And I'm just a man trying to survive. And I loved it when he said, yeah, your voice carries. I mean, yeah. just the whole interplay between the two of them on the roof is just such great writing so yeah. i that was one of the things that hooked me in the early days about the walking dead so that's my good about this episode is just the continued good banter and good witty writing Marno, um my good is glenn is the man i mean <laughs> at the end of episode one we only hear his voice but in this episode you know, he saves Rick from the the tank and, um, you know, the the minute they went down into the sewer in the shopping mall uh, and Rick's or, you know, Rick actually is like, speak your mind. And Glenn's like, no, we're doing it this way because X, Y, Z. And, you know, Stephen Yoon was about 25, 26 when um, they went into production for The Walking Dead. And he really does look like he's like 17 and to have such kind of a commanding role and, and to be able to step up and, you know, Glenn will forever be the guy that, you know, does all of the crap jobs that nobody (laughs) else can do. I mean, you know, literally going down into the sewer or being lowered into the well, or, you know, he just, he had, he does everything that nobody else can do or will do. And from the, you know, every part of this episode, uh, you know, he, he drives around in the, he, well, he wears the guts and then he drives around in the, the sports car with the, uh, alarm blaring. I mean, he just, (laughs) this, this was our big first introduction to Glenn. And I just, I can't imagine his character being introduced in any less spectacular way. See, I knew, I knew I should have gone before you. 
(laughs) (laughs) My good, and I have specifically written down introduction of Glenn to the series. (laughs) And and his humanity. Like like I think we were talking before we started recording how he uh, he told Rick uh, what was it he said? He said, I'm hoping someone would do this for me if yeah, if I'm ever in this type of situation, and uh, it just shows, yeah, everything you said about Glenn, he does it. It's like the best introduction for the character, and he does everything that no one else would want to do. Yeah, and it all ties back to the finale with Maggie saying, "Hey, this uh, is Glenn. Glenn made the decision. I'm just following his lead." Call it foolish, call it naive hope, but if I'm ever that far up blank creek somebody might do the same for me yeah and that makes and that makes me a bigger dumbass than you <laughs> <laughs> but yeah so, that, that was my good we shared our good so that's awesome yeah, it, so a uh, little bit of trivia the car that glenn drives around in uh dodge challenger uh also makes appearance in breaking bad um as yep. the car walter white buys for his son which, when you think about the connection with Michelle McLaren, it makes total sense, right? Yep, yep. I just love the the interconnected universes for AMC. By the way, another I, not, oh, go ahead. Oh, uh, another piece of trivia about about Stephen Young. This was his first audition when he moved to California. No way. Oh, yep. God. Oh. This was his first first audition, and he got it. The role of a lifetime. No kidding. That's awesome. God, yep. and. Y- you know, like I and said, he'll always be Glenn. Yeah, he will Mark. always be Glenn. We we kind of, you know, like I said, he was 25, 26, um, but he looked 17. So I feel like we got to see Glenn Stephen Yun grow up on the show. We did, you know, kind of like we do Chandler Riggs. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I bet I bet because it's his first real audition, it's we probably seen his acting mature. Throughout the seven se- or the six and a half seasons that he was in, he you know yeah. he definitely became more serious and he had a harder edge, but he still had that humanity. Well, he so, was the last character. He was the last of the main characters to have to kill a human. Right. His right. first human kill was in the Savior Compound. And oh, you know there yeah. are people who pointed to that as kind of being the sign that in fact we would lose Glenn. Yeah. yeah. Well, he was the moral compass. Yeah. Never be a moral compass, a horse, or a little girl in The Walking Dead. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, so we're so on to our bad. I, I just was going to share one more piece of trivia, and then let's go on to our bad. So I heard an interview with Stephen Yun, and I'm pretty sure I've mentioned this on Biters before, but it's one of my favorite pieces of trivia. So when he drives by the box van, and he's going, woo and sticking his arm out the the challenger mm-hmm. um it's actually not his arm it's a stunt man because he wasn't available to film that day and he said the funny thing is if you look really co- close it's like a big brawny hairy arm <laughs> 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 i've never paused it i've never looked that close i've taken his word for it <laughs> yeah I've, I've never looked that close at it and i just have but to tell you oh go ahead no, I was just going to say it happens. Well, you know, and as someone who owns a, not a Challenger, a Charger, I have to say some of the funnest cars to drive ever. I've got a friend who's got a Challenger, and oh, man, do we bond over those stupid cars. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so on to the bad. So since I went first with my good, I'll go ahead and go first with the bads. Um I have to say it was the way that Andrea was introduced. And it's totally a comic book gripe. But, you know, in the comic book, the character is very capable. She's really tough. You don't really ever get a sense of her being whiny. And I just really felt like they didn't do the character credit. They they introduce us to her sticking her gun in Rick's face, you know, blaming him for getting them in a tight situation. But she comes off as terrified and whiny. She doesn't come off as tough. She doesn't know how to handle her gun. <laughs> you know, well, just, that's one thing I liked. I liked about that scene. Is really? That, that comes back and back. Um, the whole safety thing. It does. Like when she, yeah. when, when Amy, when Amy's dying and they go over to, 
to try and get her away from Amy. And she's like, I know how she to. She pulls the gun. Yeah. She says, I know how to use the safety. Yeah. And then those were her last words to Rick before she shot herself. Oh, I don't rem- didn't her remember that that was in her death scene, her, too. Her last her last words to Rick was, I know how the safety works. Oh, God, oh. I totally forgot that was part of that scene. That's a good catch. That's cool. I yeah, just, that's why I loved that they opened, they opened, they introduced her with it. And that was like the beginning of her, the middle of her and the end of her. That's cool. And, you know, and I love the character and I actually grew to love Andrea from the TV series more, but I just was bummed out by the way that they introduced her because they didn't introduce her very strongly in this episode. I think that the the, yeah. the horrible mermaid necklace, the cheesy mermaid necklace, yeah. made her more sympathetic. I actually liked her a little better after that exchange with Rick about, well, is it considered looting? Yeah. Right. But, well, you know, overall, I feel like they didn't do her as much credit as I would have liked to have seen. But I'm glad that you pointed that out about her death scene because that's cool. Yeah, I, I have the actual complete opposite of it. I love the way they introduced her. And then I grew to hate her. Oh, like really? I just, I just, I just, I mean, with the governor or before that? Yeah, I mean, when she got to the governor, she had the chance to kill the governor, and she, she went did. out and didn't yeah. do it. And she was trying to be this politician and getting them to get. I mean, you can't do that. No, not. I mean, in this I just, universe. she just started to aggravate way. me. And then, then when she's strapped in the chair and she's got the perfectly pedicured toenails. And, <laughs> She's wasting time. I don't know. I just uh, grew to I grew to hate the character. I I wax and wane with her. Um, my my I I didn't mind the way she was introduced because I and I have this with all of the characters right now, um, which I will get to. But you know, nobody's acting like it's the zombie apocalypse, and I'm seven seasons into the zombie apocalypse. I know what's going on, but of course they don't. <laughs> I've handled a gun before. Some of these people haven't. Most of these people probably haven't, you know? So I just, I, you know, this is one of those don't open the door kind of things. And <laughs> I just, but she kind of, she's very ruled by emotion and it kind of drives me nuts sometimes. Um, when she was in the CDC and the guy was going to blow it up and she wanted to stay in there with, I was like, really? What, what are you doing? That was when uh, that was when I really she came back and then I, I started to hate her at, you know, when she was with the governor and it, and then liked her again. And then she died. And so, <laughs> yeah, I, I'm very mercur- mercurial with uh, her character. I think overall I came to like her better, even when she was with the governor. But I just, you know, especially if you know Andrea from the comic books at all, she's she's a much more powerful character than than what they give her credit for in the series. Yeah. So. Well, that was also something. Oh, that came up in uh, a panel in Walker Stock in New Jersey last year. Did it? Her and Jeffrey. Her and Jeffrey Demun were doing a panel, and oh. no one knew. No one knew, but she, Lori Holden, had a seven-year contract. <gasps> she did. She was, and the writers, the writers came to her and said, "Hey, we're going to kill you because we don't know what to do with you." Oh, <laughs> that's lame. Because there's plenty of source material about what to do with that character. <laughs> yeah, that's I mean, that's that's what yeah. they were saying in the in the panel. I know uh, that she's made comments before at Walker's Stalker Con about I should still be here and I should be with Rick. Oh yeah, she, yeah that's right. She uh, she had a seven year deal. Wow. And only that's, made that's it to lame. four. Four. That, I think what, that, that was mid season of four, I think. No, it was the end of three. Was it the end of three? Yeah. Oh, so it's even less. Yeah. Wow. But that's what happened. Huh. All right, so now before Marnie ste- Marnell steals my bad, <laughs> my bad is another character, and I bet you can guess who it is. Lori. Oh, everybody loves to hate Lori. I was totally. <laughs> I, I mean, <laughs> I'm so I glad love, you went first. I, I love, was totally gonna steal your bad. <laughs> I love, I love. I mean, I love the character Sarah Wayne Carries is amazing in person, sweetheart. But her husband was in a coma for three weeks, and <laughs> let's say, already. let's say, <laughs> let's say it, it's a week with with Rick being out of the coma and Morgan and finding them. She's already banging Shane. 
And it's I, not even like it doesn't even seem like the beginning. It's like it's like they got it on right away. Yeah, well, I keep going back to that, but I I also have to preface it by saying that the whole discussion with Rick and Shane in the car before the shooting, before the accident, Rick and she were having issues in their marriage, and that's the only way that I can explain it. It's not a good explanation, but I, I don't agree with it. I three I, weeks. I know. I know. <laughs> I know. You're having you're having trouble. That's one thing. Okay. A couple of months go by at least. Uh, yeah, exactly. Like the marital bed is not even cold yet. Like <laughs> you you can't even look your son in the eye like after kissing Shane. So yeah. And she would take she took the wedding ring off when they uh rendezvoused in the woods. She took uh, yeah. the wedding ring off and put it to the side. And, so and Thomas I just... and I are in agreement with our bads. So I will just say that that is also my bad. When Shane looked at her and like almost like he couldn't continue until she took it off. And she took it off. I'd be like, he was your partner. He was my husband. It's been a month. Deal with it if you want to get laid. <laughs> yeah. And, right? And they've obviously been doing it. They didn't just meet up in the woods and start right there. They've been doing yeah, it no. for a couple of weeks. And then he flipped her over so she he weren't going to see it anyway, Shane. <laughs> <laughs> so I have a couple of things to say. I think that the the nature of their coupling really showed me that just again that Shane just doesn't have a whole lot of respect for women. No, not I mean, not that down and dirty when you're in the mood isn't fine, but it just I, I, I just feel like there was not that was not a meeting of equals. That was not an exchange. That was Shane being dominant. The other thing is, I still fall in Brian's camp. I think they were doing it way before the zombie apocalypse. Uh, I don't, I don't think, think so. They were doing I it, think I think there was something there. I think the attraction's always been there. Right, I think he, I think he wanted her. Yes. Beforehand, but I don't think he acted upon it. Yeah, and so here's here's a little reason why is because Shane is not the type of guy to care about a woman. I mean, the way he talked about the women that he was dating, and then I, I don't maybe it was maybe it was just out of um, concern for his partner, but he's like, so how are you and Lori? You know, so. I just, I kind of feel that he was, he was always looking for an in. I think. Yeah, he that's the way I see it. I, <laughs> I don't think, I don't think he was getting it already. I think, I, th- I think he wanted it. Yeah. But I don't think, I don't think he was actually getting it. Yep. Tom and he, I are in agreement. Him and Rick, him and Rick were, were close friends before all this went down. Yeah. And really close friends don't do that. Yeah. I agree. Oh no. I've seen some pretty messed up stuff. I know you guys have too, so I'm reserving judgment. I think that that really close friends and and people who are really tight can screw each other up really bad. So now having Well, to- I if I oh, if I cuz uh John Bernthal is going to be in Nashville this weekend. I will oh, ask try him. And, I will yes. try and ask him. <laughs> <laughs> tell okay, now, tell him it's now an having, ongoing uh, quibble on baiters or biters whether or not he's actually uh, whether or not he was actually involved with Lori before the ZA or not. <laughs> I'm gonna so, try and find out. Right having on. totally having totally crapped on Shane, um, we love John Bernthal, and I have to say that I cannot wait for the Punisher to come out. Um, I I really liked Daredevil on Netflix and and Jessica Jones and Iron Fist not so much, but we won't discuss <laughs> that. But I can't wait. He was he was on Daredevil in The Punisher, and I think he did an amazing job. And I can't wait for his series to come out. So yeah, I, Daredevil yeah. Daredevil was great. Yeah, I can't wait for him to have his own his own series on on The Punisher. So and please, if you're on social media, just because I said I think that Shane and Lori were doing it before the ZA doesn't mean you have my permission to harass John Bernthal or Sarah Wayne Callies <laughs> on social media. Please. No, don't troll anyone on social yeah. media. No. There's enough horrible crap in the world. Be nice to each other. Harass Diane. It's her opinion. <laughs> <laughs> hey, yeah, what's your Twitter handle? But don't make me cry and, and disable my account. That wouldn't be nice. No. <laughs> No. All right. So uglies. We're on into our uglies. So, yeah. I, you know, I really kind of thought, what am I going to do as my ugly? And then I decided that I was going to give it up for Merle. 
Oh my God. Ah, are we, are we all in agreement on our ugly? <laughs> my ugly, my ugly good was Rooker. Oh, that's oh. awesome. I, I think we are, our, our character, we've all, our uglies are all Merle, but we all have something a little different. What is yours, Diane? I just, you know, I was thinking as I was watching him, remember when we thought Merle was the scariest thing happening? Remember when we thought Merle was the bad guy? But I yeah. also just, I thought Rooker played it so well, and he he was a pleasure to loathe. So, <laughs> I mean, he played... He was brilliant. A, yeah, he was. He played a really slimy character. He did it beautifully. His uh, He redeemed the character fairly well. I mean, he really did make you appreciate Merle and where Merle was coming from. I just... Uh, and, you know... Rooker's one of those guys that you've seen in a million different things and you never really knew who he was until he got this big break in The Walking Dead. I know that's horrible to say. There are probably people out there who are huge Michael Rooker fans. But, you know, he wasn't a household name until... Okay, so Kirkman was a big Michael Rooker fan. He Kirkman stated that he was thrilled upon hearing the actor's appearance and added that he had known... Of Rooker in co- the comedy film Mall Rats from oh 1995. Oh my god, that's awesome! And he, Kevin Smith. That's yes, awesome. he was pleased with Rooker's report performance, retorting that it was Michael the Michael Rooker Rooker show for one solid episode. That's so, awesome. Kirkman yep. is a Ma- Rooker fan. Mall Rats and uh, Henry Portrait of a Serial Killer. Ooh, I'll I have those to watch his, that. Yeah, those were his two big ones. I think that that. I think just recently is it's like a 20th anniversary or 25th anniversary or something. Did he play Henry Lee Lucas? I didn't see it. I'll have to look because was this, I know he he played Henry. It's totally so a, I, a murderista, a murderino thing from My Favorite Murder. So I'll have to look. <laughs> yeah, totally. Oh, he's in the Belko experiment too. That was one that I complained. I, that I saw that. Did you? I uh, yes. it did not come to town. We we have two theaters, and um, I think there's a total of maybe seven screens, and uh, yeah. So we we were lucky to get Train Spotting too, um, which was good. But we did not get the Belco experiment, which I really wanted to see. It was it was pretty good actually. Yeah. I mean, he he didn't play a huge role in it. Yeah, but he he was in it. But what you're else? you're forgetting his main. His main thing now, Guardians right? Of Guardians, Galaxy. right? Guardians He's of the Galaxy you. one and two. Yep. Yes. So I heard the two was fantastic. I haven't seen it yet, to be honest. But I, I just, I heard rave reviews from our farrier and her husband when they came out and saw our horses. So I, I heard Rooker is like the star of two. Yeah, that's awesome. Okay. Yeah, he it's it's he has an amazing, a huge role in in two, and I don't want to spoil it at all, but. I, I just want to say we watched it and we laughed. It was one of those we laughed so hard that we are actually going to go have to see it again to catch uh, everything that happened after we laughed. Good. So we actually we want to see it again. So um, and I think it was it stayed at number two. It's a, the third week in the box office and it's still like number two. Um, yeah. So very good. Yeah. Well, I also have to I say I haven't seen it so. I I like Michael Rooker because he's interesting and a little bit creepy when he's on some of the interview shows. So I I just think that he would be a really fun person to party with. But I think I said before I'd yeah. like to have a lot of bail money if I was out with him. <laughs> <laughs> or Thomas, I think you said have him make the bail. Yeah, well, he's uh he's a little uh when you when you see any of his panels, he is so out there. Yeah. Like most of the most of the panels they'll sit they'll sit on stage and audience will ask questions. He gra- every one of his panels, he grabs the mic and he runs into the audience and he's running from person to person <laughs> answering questions. He oh, would man. be the total, total guy that, that I would want to uh sit down and have a drink with. Nice. So um anything else you guys want to add in terms of why he was your ugly? Um, well, he was my ugly. My ugly is not a good or bad. It's a question. I don't think that I could have left Merle. I think that I would have, as T-Dog, as anyone, I think I would have stayed up there and helped, even if it meant missing my ride out of, out of you know, uh, the building uh, out of Atlanta. I think... I think that I don't I don't even as as much of a jerk as he was and, and, you know, he was that big of a jerk to me. 
I still am not to the point where I could leave somebody behind like that. I, I think that I would have grabbed the toolbox and started, you know, hammering her away at that pipe or, or the, the handcuff chain or something. I just, you know, and then it would have been the two of us trying to get out together and not leaving him behind. Could you have left Morley behind? I would have. I probably, <laughs> I quite honestly, I probably would have as well after he beat the crap the way out of me he, on the roof. Yeah, that's exactly it. The way he treated him. And like he said, when he wanted, uh, he was trying to be nice to T Dog to unlock him. Right. And then T Dog turns to him and he's like, Do you want me to get that rifle so that when the cop comes back up, you can shoot him? And right. Merle was gonna. Merle was gonna get that <laughs> rifle and shoot Rick if he had come back up. T Dog totally I, like, read him for who he was. Like I said, I, I, seven seasons in, I think I absolutely could have left him. But season one, I don't know if I could have left a human being behind. But T-Dog struggled with it, too. Yeah, I he mean, did. He, he did go back and he rechained, he chained the door chained shut the door. so nothing could get there. Exactly. And he was clearly I mean, distressed he, when he admitted to everyone that he dropped the key. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But, so yeah. what I, I actually wrote on the rewatch, Marnell, is that... Like, especially when they show Rooker screaming at the end, I wrote, all of us loathe him, but want to do the human thing. So we would all yeah. want to do the right thing, but if it was, a, at, especially at that point in the ZA, but if it was a choice between missing, making it back to the camp and saving the redneck sadist, I think I would probably not miss my ride back to the camp. See, and I, 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 I look at Merle and what he became and he, he actually did, you know, he, lo- he, as screwed up as he was, he did love his brother and he did ha- kind of help them in the end. And I, I really, I, I really wonder that if you, if somebody would have offered a hand at that point, if it maybe it could have changed the course. No pun like- intended. <laughs> <laughs> I would argue that you're pulling in a lot of context that the characters don't have at that point, though. Right, that's what I would have said. They don't yeah, know yeah. that he's going to do that. No, no, not at all. But I, I'm, I'm always for, you know, redemption and and you know, people. You never know what somebody has gone through to make them who they are, and maybe if you would have helped him, that that may have changed the course of Merle. Dear God, you're but they're a bigger basing bl- it. They're basing it on what they know and the fact that he beat, he hit Rick. He didn't even know Rick. He hit Rick. He was beating the crap out of T-Dog. And then he put himself in charge because he had a gun. Right. I mean, yeah. he was putting everyone else at risk. Yeah. You're a bigger bleeding know. heart than I am, Marnell. I am. <laughs> <laughs> I am. I'm. Liberals. I... <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> So Thomas, did you have what was part of your ugly? I mean, that- my ugly good was just basically what Diane said. I mean, he was brilliant in that role. Like you believe, like I when I watch it, I believe that Michael Rook, like so just looking that. at him, I believe that Michael Rooker is a racist yes. and a sexist, and because he portrayed it so spot on. Yeah, I mean. Every, and I mean, and that goes back to Diane's good too. The writing, mm-hmm. it was like it was so spot on, and he was just brilliant. Like the one thing The Walking Dead does the best out of everything, and it does a lot of things great. The casting, whoever casts people, mm-hmm. I mean, I can't think of a character that was miscast throughout seven seasons. And I mean, and when they cast them, they cast them well because Rooker yeah. was perfect i mean he had the look he had the tone everything about him was perfect i agree yeah no one jumps to mind that it was miscast i i totally agree with that I mean, and, and a lot of people don't a lot of the cast that you see you never heard of yes like personally i never knew who andrew lincoln was i never saw or was it love action mm-hmm. or whatever he was in yeah ne- never heard of him never knew him but he's perfect I I agree. And I think even the characters that we aren't that fond of, like Pollyanna McIntosh, for what they were looking for, I don't agree with what they put into the story, but for what they were looking for, they they did good casting. Yeah. Yeah. And and Rooker was like the prime example to me. I mean, episode number two was perfectly cast guy. 
when he and I had seen him before. He was the biggest name, I think, to me really? in the show when it started. I'm trying to think. There wasn't anybody that really he was, stuck out. He was in Cliffhanger. He was in he was in a bunch of things that I had seen. Well, and he's also the voice in a lot of um, video games. Uh, Call of Duty, uh, Jonah Hex, a uh, bunch of others that I can't think of right now. But yeah, so I mean, he's he's got such a recogn. I mean, he's one of those that he's so recognizable and his voice is so distinct. But when he's in a role, I never think Michael Rooker. I always think Yondu or... Merle right. or you know whoever he is he always embodies that role yeah i don't right. think it's, it, like, it's yeah. like the opposite it's the opposite of andrew lincoln and chandler Riggs, where they'll always be rick they'll always be carl he takes on all these roles and he's that character for that time and then he's something else and then he moves yeah. on yeah yeah he uh, by the way he was henry in henry portrait of a serial killer it, is it is it about henry lee lucas because um, that's what i'm that's my hunch I it was seen night- it. 1986. Uh, um, I didn't see it. I don't uh, know. I'll have to watch. I'll yeah, have to watch it for know. my favorite murder and then right into them. <laughs> 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 well, so what do you guys smell? Rotting potpourri. <laughs> I smell Jameson's. <laughs> <laughs> and lots of it. Oh, I'm still recovering from Elderberry Cosmos last night, which were fantastic. But oh, I'm not going to do that again I, for a while. <laughs> I'm drinking Alaska Summer Ale. Nice. Yeah. All right. So you want? I got. I got one piece of info. Go for it. Lead off. Um, when Rooker was on the roof of the building shooting, uh, apparently the this was in downtown Atlanta, mm-hmm. and the citizens there didn't know that they were shooting. Oh, no. What? So the Atlanta police were called, and the FBI and the police showed up at the base of the building <laughs> because they saw a guy in the <laughs> oh roof with God. a gun. <laughs> oh, my goodness. That's kind of awesome. That's so yeah. scary, though. Yeah. Somebody yeah, screwed up. Somebody, somebody didn't tell somebody something. Yeah, because the they showed up. Yeah, and, uh, I'm sure they got it worked out, but it was probably pretty scary for for a little bit there. Hopefully, they got donuts and autographs. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, yeah, you had my other one. I had a uh, the red charger from Breaking Bad. That uh, that was one of my potpourri ah uh, yeah ideas. I enjoy the links between the other series. I enjoy looking for things like, or, you know, not really looking for things like that. I mean, I definitely didn't know that about the Challenger until I had watched this series a few times, but, you know, caught on to the blue meth right away in season two. So I think right. stuff like that's really pretty neat when they were able to do that. Yeah. Yeah. Put it in the same universe. Um the just a little bit of trivia we were talking about. I couldn't find the uh, plus seven numbers, um, but Guts was watched by four point seven million viewers, slightly down from its pilot episode. It is the lowest rated episode of The Walking Dead to date. Really? Really? Wow. That yes. seems odd to me. That is it. OK. That's on Wikia and the Walking Dead wiki. Huh. Um I yeah. would have thought the pilot, to be honest. Was the lowest no. rated one? Yeah, because just because, like I said last week, uh, I hadn't even heard of it. So I didn't even know to watch. Uh, so I figured their audience would be lower because they they didn't know about it. Right, but if you saw the first, steam. No, and if you point. saw the first episode, especially the way it ended, you would want to see the second episode to see how Rick gets out of that tank. Right. 4.7 versus 5.35. Uh, Days Gone By was 5.35. So, yeah, slightly down. Um, and I guess and what's funny is uh, it premiered on Halloween. And how many people are home watching TV on Halloween other than, I guess, maybe handing out candy? <laughs> So yeah, I, think I don't know. The other thing is, it would be interesting to look at if there was some way, and I don't know how you would do it, but to adjust the numbers 
so that you could compare season one numbers to latter seasons because I wonder if there aren't if there was some sort of adjustment other episodes that are less viewed or or less popular than Guts because Guts is a pretty good episode. It is. I think most of the first season was pretty fantastic. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I mean, there's bits here and there where it's a little slow or whatnot, but but I mean, I don't, I couldn't fault any episode in the first season. Well, and I can't, I, I don't know what the numbers are for um, uh, the book fans, you know, how, how what the, the sales were for the Walking Dead comic books, but I'm sure, you know, there was a lot of uh, comic book fans who tuned in, you know, episode one, season one, uh, you know, looking to see, you know, either out of curiosity or fandom or, you know, because they stayed pretty true to the books as far as I know in season one. They were all turned off by the horse being eaten. <laughs> <laughs> I was just thinking, you know, I mean, it part of it's the company we keep, but I haden't heard anyone really complain about the the adaptation to the comic books and, and whether or not they were dissatisfied or satisfied with things veering from the comic books. I mean, most of the comic book fans that I know and that I've heard interviews with are happy with what they're doing. Yeah, but like... Um, again, it's Darryl, also self-selecting, so... Daryl wasn't in the comic books, and Andrea was actually supposed to be the group sniper at this point, and that was taken over by... Um, <sighs> Sasha. Sasha, thank you. Yeah. We don't know who that's going to fall to now. Not Michonne. <laughs> no. Uh, you never know. Yeah, she's going to have to get a little better with her rifle. <laughs> Maybe Enid. You know, who, you, you know who I think it could come down? It could be is the girl from uh, the girl that was a good shot from uh, Oceanside. Because oh, Oceanside. I can't believe good she's call. not going to come back into the episode, into this, into the series. Yeah, I can't believe they're not going to bring Oceanside back. And they made a point of singling her out. So I think that's a good... Yeah, and they made a point of mentioning how she's a really good shot. Yeah. 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 But I don't read the comics, so I don't know what happens. Well, as far as I know, and I'm not super far along, but as far as I know, they don't have Oceanside in the comic books. I still haven't read all of the All Out War arc, but I think that they're an invention for the show. Hmm. And Yeah, I don't know. I I know they don't have the garbage people. Right. That I know. Right. Yeah. And I didn't realize this. I had to kind of question myself, and then I was reading on the Walking Dead wiki. Merle is not in the book either, and I had forgotten that. I For some reason, I had thought that Daryl was I... an invention, but Merle was not. But Merle apparently also does not show up in the comic books. I thought he was. Uh-uh. Huh. Yeah, when, oh, wow. he, uh, when he hooked up with the governor and had the blade for the hand... I thought that was in the books. Yeah, I don't think so. I'm going to have to go back and read with all the other stuff. I'm going to have to go back and read and watch. <laughs> <laughs> well, did you go back and watch the first episode to see the vanishing blood? No, only because I had watched it like three times before we ended up podcasting <laughs> last week. <laughs> so you just fast forward to that one scene. And there you go. <laughs> I know I'm going to watch it again because I'm going to run into somebody who needs to be introduced to The Walking Dead. So it's always the best when you can introduce someone to it. Yep. Um, I realized when we were watching this tonight that uh, the scene where Glenn and Morales go down into the sewer pipes, that the scene where Ross or not Ross, Aaron and uh and Maggie do it in this season or last season. I think it was season six. I didn't realize, but that was a total callback. It was a callback that I missed I, at the time. Yeah. I didn't realize it. I, you, that's true. And it looks almost, it looks identical. It does. Repurpose sets. <laughs> yeah. From seven years ago. <laughs> Um, going back to what Diane said at the beginning, part of her good, I absolutely loved, it's funny, they called them geeks, Glenn called them geeks. Right. I'm kind of glad that we dropped that, but it's, it was kind of funny to hear in the beginning. Um, and then I absolutely love that, uh, uh, Rick called himself officer friendly. <laughs> well, back to that point, I was curious because when I watched it, the first thing Glenn said was he called them walkers. 
on the radio when Rick was in the tank. Oh, and, I and, mean, you're right. And I, I didn't catch that. And I'm pretty sure Morgan called them walkers too. So it's kind of weird that the two of them that they would have would the, same them the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. But that, that struck me as odd. I think that was just maybe a writing gaffe. Yeah. They, first thing, if I saw a zombie, I wouldn't call it a walker. <laughs> yeah. I think we've discussed this before. Have we decided that there are no such thing as zombie movies in the walking dead universe? Yeah. In this like, universe, there's no zombie. Okay. Yeah, they. I think. I think. Uh, I don't know if it was Nick Otero. Someone said they don't know anything about. Yeah, it. they've been pretty clear about that. Which is kind of weird, but. I guess it would be kind of like they, our world without Dracula, you know. <laughs> yeah, if we have a vampire outbreak. Yeah. yeah. What, what are we going to call them? Biters. Biters. <laughs> yeah. <Exactly. laughs> So that actually brings up something that I was thinking while I was watching this again. And, you know, I think the walkers were a little scarier when we saw more of their humanity. So when we saw them in these early days and they're they're not so desiccated and decayed and they look really human, there's that walker that sniffs at Rick as they're coming out first in the meat ponchos. Mm-hmm. And, yeah. um, and he's kind of a middle-aged guy and he just, he looks like someone who's recently dead And they just, they look more scary. They look more threatening because they still look like us. Well, and they're still, again, we we talked about this um, in the premiere, that um, the the walkers that are pounding on the windows, one of them has a rock. So again, they still have human characteristics. Yeah. And then one looked like he was trying to climb up after Rick and Glenn. Mm -hmm. and And they, and they ran. Yeah, when when Glenn and Rick were running to the fence, Norm nowadays in in season it's seven, terrible. you could run to you could run to the fence. You'd have plenty of time. But yeah. in this episode, they were running after them. Yeah, I kind of wish for at least for continuity's sake that in the the later seasons they would have kept that for newly created walkers that they sort of retained some of their like their human instincts about like using tools or climbing onto stuff or whatever or running. Than them automatically just being shamblers, mindless shamblers. Right. That would they even I make mean, a. They even make a point of that when uh, Milton is performing his, performing his right. experiments yeah. about how the guy the guy has no like once he came back he had no recollection of anything. Yeah. Now I'm gonna have to watch that season again. <laughs> <laughs> That's one of the seasons that I haven't really binged on, so I'm gonna have to go back and watch that season all over again. <laughs> Well, you have six months. Just watch them all. all there you go. <laughs> I'm up to season three. <laughs> so the other thing I wanted to say about the walkers was that I think they're also scarier because they all really seem like they're suffering. You know, they make these moans and groans and we see the one walker who's crawling along on her hands, but her hands are all deformed. And, right. and I think yeah. that for us as human beings, we see we see human beings suffering. And I think that yeah. that makes them scarier, too. Well, I think it's also scarier because, I mean, if we're watching this for the first time, right. we don't know we don't know what's going to happen in, in the future. Now, we have seven years, we have seven seasons worth of walkers, and now the walkers aren't an issue. Right, because they're not nearly as scary as, for example, Negan. Right. Fear the dead, fight the... What, right. what is it? Fear the dead, yep. fight the living. Yep, exactly. Yeah. Yep. So, um, and you know, the humans are still, uh, everyone still has, I, I, I mean, you know, Rick, Rick was running around shooting walkers in the head, but when it came time to dismember the one guy for his guts, you know, he read off the guy's name from his wallet and, you know, I'm going to tell my, my kid, my wife and son about Wayne, whatever Wayne, his name was. Wayne Dunlap. Wayne Dunlap. Yeah. 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 (laughs) And so we still have feelings about killing human beings at this point. So I thought that's that's also another interesting part about watching it from the beginning. And, you know, I when we did the meat ponchos again in season six, I think, end of season six, um, you know, nobody had any qualms about ripping anyone open. Nobody took out anybody's wallet to find out their names. Yeah, they didn't look for ID. Yeah, or to see or to see if they were organ donors. 
That was a nice touch. And that's actually one of the moments I like in this is that Rick does take the time to to do that and to eulogize that that walker as a person. But yeah, I mean, I think that it really shows the evolution of of how we as the audience and how they as the characters view the zombies. Right, right. So does that bring us to a close? I think that's about it for me. Do you guys have anything else? That's, that's pretty much it for me. All right. So next episode More is... I'm, I'm done until next time. Next episode is <laughs> Vatos. Which is... Sorry, I'm fuzzing out. I'm having trouble with my connection on my mic for some reason tonight. Um, so Vatos is one of my favorites. It's still one of my favorites. So I'm looking forward to talking about that one. Um, I think you're wrong. I think it's still to the frogs. Yeah, the oh, next one's still to the shoot, frogs. Oh, shoot, you're right. Four is Vatos. <laughs> oh. Vatos is number four. Dang. God, I'm so I was going to cool. let it go. No, thank you for calling me on it. I'm so not cool. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like looking at all the like wiki pages and I finally click back to IMDb and I'm like, no, 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 that's oh, not right. That's I'm only a guest. I don't want to uh, <laughs> insult the, the host. When you're here, you're family. That's right. We're all family. <laughs> so yeah, it's tell tell it to the frogs and stuff. Frog. <laughs> Excellent. Oh. Excellent. Right, so and, oh, until then, remember take it. Take one, it one dead, dead day. day at a time. time. <laughs> Another bad one. We gotta get the rhythm. We gotta get yeah. the rhythm. We,